Hey, I've got a question for you. You ever been in a situation where you didn't realize it was that bad? Right? Like, you take your car to the mechanic. You didn't realize it was that bad. Okay, you need a new transmission or something. Or, or something goes wrong in your house. You didn't realize it was that bad. Well, when I moved here to Manteca and went to the dentist after a couple years, I didn't realize it was that bad. And I'm sitting in the dentist chair after he took x-rays, and he had his assistant, and he was checking all my teeth out, and he kept hollering out numbers, like upper number three left, upper number four left, lower eight, nine, ten, right, inside left. I go, what are those numbers? He said, cavities. I said, oh, oh, my goodness. I brushed my teeth. What, 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 what? I mean, I left that place with like 10 cavities and some crowns that I had to get done. It took about four visits. It was worse than I thought. Man. Well, I tell you, um, <laughs> you know, sometimes our culture doesn't realize how bad it's gotten. Uh, we live in a fallen world, and uh, we're going through the book of Romans, and we're in chapter 1, and... Paul begins this study, this book, this letter to the, the mighty Roman Empire, trying to communicate to the believers that are there, hey, you know, things are pretty messed up. Okay, the Roman, uh, uh, you know, the Roman Empire might be the, the world's superpower at the time. It might be known for its uh, military and its architectural achievements, the beautiful buildings, the advanced civilizations. But, man, you look under the hood, you peel back a couple of layers, and uh, the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, you don't realize how bad it is. The values, there's rampant uh, promiscuity, fornication, immorality, adultery, homosexuality, pedophilia, um, corruption, crime, violence. Uh, we entertain ourselves by people killing each other. Th there's a problem here, Paul is saying, as he begins the letter to the Romans. And later, he's going to come down to the cure, God's answer. And this morning's going to be a little bit of a tough one, but I want to give you the answer before we talk about how messed up uh, Rome was and how messed up our culture can be. So if you've got your notes or if you've got it on uh, the church app on your phones, here's where we're, gonna, where we're gonna start. God's answer to humankind's problem is Jesus. I had to go to a Bible college and seminary for about seven years to learn that, okay? <laughs> seven years. Jesus. Now that might sound simple to you and I, that might sound ridiculous to the world, but I am telling you it's the truth. God's answer to humankind's problem is Jesus. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, but God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he sent Jesus to die for us. While we were still sinners. He, he didn't wait until we all got cleaned up, right? Why we were still in the muck and mess, going our own way, he showed his love for us. That sacrificial love, that unconditional love, and he was willing to send his own son to die for you and I. That's good news, amen, church? That is good news. So. I wanted, to, I wanted to make sure that you heard that, because that doesn't come till around chapter four or five. But when we're muddling through chapter one and two, it gets rough, okay? So I wanted to encourage you with the good news, and now we're gonna get into it, okay? And we're gonna find out just how a culture crumbles when they abandon uh, God. But before we do, let's talk with God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Thank you, Lord, for this time together to study your word, to actually look and see what it says. Um, we do live in a fallen world uh, where, man, the operations are so below the standards that you have set for humanity. And the apostle Paul, your servant, lays it out pretty clearly 
in the book of Romans. I pray that um, you'd touch our hearts and our minds regarding this passage today. Help us not be so eager to point the finger at others, but to examine ourselves and see if we are living the lives that you've called us to live. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray and thank you. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right. Now, a culture crumbles when it first ignores its creator. When it ignores its creator. Now, a lot of folks have different ideas of what God is like. I think a lot of people love to view God as this kind of old, senile grandfather figure, you know? With the long beard, and yes, he's got standards that he wants us to obey, but he's not going to really get that upset about it if we don't. He's just happy that we're trying, right? He's just happy that we're trying. Well, That's not really the God of the Bible. That's not the God that the Apostle Paul presents to the Romans. So it begins this way in verse 18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, (laughs) comes right out of the gate. Bam, 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 bam. Okay, I told you, buckle your seatbelts for this one today, okay? Now, what is unrighteousness? I'm going to find that as acts contrary to God's nature. Acts contrary to God's will for our lives. Acts that don't meet the righteous and holy standards of a righteous and holy God. And he talks about those who suppress the truth. Think of, you know, trying to... Put a lid on something. That's what we try to do when we uh, act out in ungodly or unrighteous ways. We're trying to suppress God's God's truth in our conduct or thinking. And for all intents and purposes, we're ignoring God. We're just ignoring God. So then Paul goes on and he says, he makes a case now that you can't ignore God because God has revealed himself to everybody. And he says this in verse 19 and 20, For what can be known about God is plain to them. Not only the world during Paul's time, and the Roman world, and that empire, but in our time too. For what can be known about God is plain to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made, so that we're all without excuse. In other words, God's saying, look, within each one of us, human beings created in the image of God, God has placed this self-evident awareness that he exists. All you have to do is look around at a beautiful snow-capped mountain range, or a deep forest, or a, a clear cold, rushing mountain stream, or look over the ocean. Take time and pause at night and look at the vastness of the universe. That's what it's saying. It's self-evident. And we should realize, as God's creation, made in his image, there's this, there's this hole inside each of us that only God can fill. Right? So it should be self-evident, um, and yet people ignore those clues that God has given us of his existence, and it's called sin. You think of, of Noah's time. You don't have to get in your Bible too far before you get to about chapter 5 and, and, or 6, and it says that uh, humankind had become so wicked that God regretted that he made us. That's pretty bad. And they weren't repenting. And they were ignoring God. And so he um, responded in his wrath, and he flooded the earth and wiped out that culture at that time, except for one righteous man and his family. 
and that was Noah. See, even within the midst of God's wrath, he's always going to respond compassionately to the individual. And that's good to know. So I guess my encouragement, church, as we begin this morning is, you know, make the right decision. Choose to acknowledge God in your life, no matter what our culture says. No matter what our culture says. You know, about, about 12, 13 days ago, I was watching football. And uh, one of the, the Buffalo Bills players, a guy by the name of DeMar Hamlin, just fell flat on his back, out cold. All the medical personnel came rushing to him. Apparently, his heart had stopped beating. It's one thing to get the wind knocked out of you. It's one thing to, you know, kind of get hit hard, but it's another thing when your heart stops beating. His heart had stopped beating for nine minutes on the field. My wife is a nurse. She was looking at it saying, this is serious. This is serious. And they stopped the game. They didn't play it. It was all over the news. Uh, everybody was, was praying for this football player, Damar Hamlin, uh, that he would recover. And, and it was incredible. There was a sports announcer, a guy by the name of Dan Orlovsky, who was talking about all the prayers that were coming in. And he did something pretty unique in our culture today. He prayed on national TV. Let me show you the clip. You know, and I think even through the midst of absolute tragedy last night, I think you saw some of the beauty of football as well, but it's brought us all here together. Um, you know, like, this is a little bit different. I heard, I've heard it all day, like, thoughts and prayers. And you just heard Scherf and Jonathan Allen say, like, all we can do is pray for him. And I've heard the Buffalo Bills organization say that we believe in prayer. And maybe this is not the right thing to do, but I want to, it's just on my heart that I want to pray for It him. is. Damar Hamlin, right, right, right now. Um, I'm going to do it out loud. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to bow my head, and I'm just going to pray for him. Um... God, we come to you in these moments that we don't understand, that are hard, uh, because we believe that your God and coming to you and praying to you um, has impact. We're, we're sad, we're angry, um, and we want answers, but some things are unanswerable. We just want to pray, truly come to you and pray for strength for Damar, for healing for Damar, for comfort for Damar to be with his family, to give them peace. If we didn't believe that prayer didn't work, we wouldn't ask this of you, God. Um, I believe in prayer. We believe in prayer. We lift up Damar Hamlin's name in your name. Amen. 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 It's beautiful. Respectfully. Is that amazing or what? I mean, that was on NFL Live, ESPN, national TV. Dan Orlovsky could have been fired for that, but he made a decision. You know what? Everybody's talking about prayer in this moment of crisis, and I don't know if this is right. I don't know if this is appropriate, but I'm just going to pray. How about we pray? There's a thought. And he went and did it. Wow. Awesome. Praise God for guys like that. Secondly, a culture crumbles when it redefines its creator. See, with, with uh, human beings' pride and ignorance and foolishness, we can get to a point where we want to actually redefine who God is, and that can lead us to worshiping the Creator rather than the Creator, uh, making idol gods for ourselves that we bow down to, so to speak. Um, in the ancient days, the Egyptians looked at the sun, and they worshiped the sun, uh, the Nile River would overflow its banks every year and provide fertile soil. And so they began to worship the Nile River. Um, the, the Israelites themselves, when Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, he was gone a little too long. And God's children, the Israelites, became impatient. And they created for themselves a, a golden sta a calf an image made out of, of their own jewelry, and they worship this. 
And God was very angry with them, and many of them perished for that sin. You see, some of the Canaanite cultures of the ancient day, they worshipped a god called Moloch. And one of the ways of worshipping Moloch was to uh, give a child for a human sacrifice, to worship that god. And then there's the many, many uh, gods of the Greeks and the Romans, one of them being Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty and fertility and sexual pleasure. And where Paul was writing the letter to the Romans in the city of Corinth, they had the largest temple up on a mountain to the goddess Aphrodite, where worshipers would come and have sex with some of the temple prostitutes pay money, and that's how you would worship this this goddess, okay? Culture crumbles when it redefines its creator. And Paul addresses this in Romans chapter 1, verse 21 to 23, when he says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, (laughs) making golden calves. How stupid is that? and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. The Greek word is moros, where we get our word moron. (laughs) They became morons, the apostle Paul says. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. Wow. See, notice, he says that, listen, humanity has this knowledge of God, but, but will choose to make gods in their own image. And this will create kind of a downward spiral of sin. It starts with willing ignorance of God. It, it, it leads to uh, imitating God in the things that we might make. And then finally, we simply just replace what we've made with the one true God. Now, let me stop here for a moment. You and I, we don't worship trees, okay? Maybe some guys in Oregon are tree huggers, but we don't worship trees, okay? (laughs) We don't do that. We don't worship the sun. You might have a little tiki in your backyard, but you don't bow down and worship to that thing, all right? Um, But but we might, might, uh, in our own way, hold up a person, maybe a celebrity or an athlete, or a guy or a girl, or we might hold up a person that takes the place of God in our lives. We might spend all our time with a pleasure that replaces God in our lives, or, or we might be seeking position and power in our career to the point where we neglect our relationship with God, or perhaps we have um, purchased a possession that car, that boat, that house, that, that second house, and it consumes all of our time, all of our energy, all of our money. Those are subtle idols, too, in 2023, where we might redefine God. And then there's our culture. Um, you know, so many of us, believers or not, we just buy into whatever the culture is selling, uh, believe whatever is taught, in the universities as God is being refined. Um, Hey, my kids even went to some, quote, Christian universities, and they were basically told the Bible is irrelevant. It's filled with myths. The media shows us sex outside of marriage, like, all the time. That's the norm. Um, And then finally, the state defines what marriage is, not the God who created it or his word. The Bible tells us this, to be careful. In the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 8, again, this is the Apostle Paul, and he says this, see to it that no one takes you captive. That no one has a grip on you. See to to that nobody takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to what? Human tradition. According to the elemental spirits of the world. And not according to Christ. Choose the creator. 
Don't buy everything is it, the culture's trying to sell you, all right? So culture crumbles when it ignores its creator. It crumbles when it redefines its creator, the Apostle Paul is saying. And now he keeps taking his argument further. A culture crumbles when it abandons all sexual restraint. See, again, the world sees the church um, and preachers like me as, uh, as rigid or old-fashioned, out of touch, uninformed about sex. I got news for you, culture. My God created sex. It was his idea, all right, that uh, male and female would come together to reproduce in the mammalian world, and he lays out his original design for the sexual relationship in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 24. It says this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast, be united sexually to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's God's intent for, for the sexual relationship that it would be between a man and a woman uh, in a committed, lifelong, loving relationship for the purpose of reproduction, for enjoyment, for building intimacy between that husband and wife relationship. That's where it started. That's the creator's original intent. Now, has it been distorted? Absolutely. Why? You just have to go to the next chapter in the book of Genesis to find out. Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sinned. That's why. With their sin, uh, all of their ancestors, all of their descendants in humanity, up to this point, including you and I, we have within us a sin nature. This nature that will question God. This nature that wants to do our own thing. This nature that will rebel against uh, the word and the teachings of God. And that's where we get a culture where sexually anything goes. And that's where it started. So Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. He's talking about sexual impurity here. To the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. In other words, they weren't acting in the original design for uh, sexual relationships in the committed relationship of marriage between a man and a woman. Verse 25, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. Now, uh, it, it talks about God gave them up. Do you see that in verse 24? Maybe we can go back to that slide. It says God gave them up. Uh, what that term refers to is the act of allowing the sinner to reap the consequences of the sin. Okay? God will give us up to our sin if that's what we've decided to do. If we're going to ignore him, if we're going to put him in a little box and stash him over here, God will give us up to our futile thinking, to our moronic thinking, as Paul has said. I mean, we've all seen this, right? When I was a kid, okay, maybe, I don't know, maybe junior high, I had a friend that lived down the street. His name was Billy. And, you know, Billy's parents, you know, I loved them. They were great to me, actually. You know, we have sleepovers, all that stuff. We were in Boy Scouts together, sports together. I loved this family. But they weren't a Christian family, and they lived by different values than my family. And uh, Billy's dad wanted to teach him a little bit about sex. So if you can believe this, this was back in the 70s, okay? He got his son a subscription to Playboy. 
as a junior hire. For those of you that are under 30, that's a magazine. <laughs> Playboy was a magazine before it was all over the internet, okay? Billy was a very popular kid, all right? All his friends wanted to hang out at Billy's house to check out his library, if you know what I mean. So Billy kind of grew up with all these images, and so when he started dating, you know, he started sleeping with his girlfriends, and he was about 18 or 19 and got his girlfriend pregnant. And that made his life really hard, and it made the lives of his parents really hard as well. As he started bringing children into this world, and he wasn't ready to take care of them. In other words, God will, God will give us up to our sinful behavior and let us um, experience the consequences of that. Now, let me stop for a minute and say, listen, God loved my friend Billy, and he loved Billy's family. He loves you. He loves me. You don't have to get cleaned up when you come to church if you don't know the Lord. Come as you are, all right? And the Holy Spirit will do his work in your life. That's my hope and my prayer. God loves us. While we were still sinners, God loved us so much, he sent Jesus to die for us. Remember what we talked about in the beginning? God loves us. But let me say in the same breath, he takes our sins seriously, believe it or not. I'm going to speak love to you today, but I'm also going to speak to you the truth. God's truth. So now, <laughs> the argument progresses, and it gets even more intense. In verse 26, Paul is giving more examples of uh, a, a culture that has abandoned all sexual restraint, that has ignored God, redefined God in their own image. So he says in Romans 1, 26 and 27, for this reason God gave them up, again, you wanna do this, I'll let you do it, and you'll receive the consequences of your sin. God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were, cons were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Physically, I think he's talking about sexually transmitted diseases. In general, he's talking about uh, homosexuality uh, between women, between uh, men. He brings up the term natural relations. What he's talking about there are sexual relations that God established between men and women in creation. God ordained sexual practices reserved for a man and a woman, a husband and a wife within a committed lifelong marriage relationship. That's what he's saying. Now, in the Roman culture at that time, in many cultures at that time, in the Greek culture at that time, homosexuality was practiced, just like it is today in our culture, in our world, except it was forbidden for the Jews in writing, in their scriptures. Let me just show you. In Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, this is the law of Moses. And it says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. So it's pretty clear. The Bible teaches in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that homosexual practice is sinful. There, I've said it. But I didn't say it. God said it. God wrote this. I didn't write it, I'm just the messenger. But if you don't hear it from me, you're not gonna hear it anywhere else in our society. You won't hear it. That's why it's so unique and it blows my mind when people like a, news, a sports newscaster will pray on air. People just don't do that. Taking a stand for his faith in a culture that has abandoned God.
Now, some might say, well, what about same-sex orientation? Um, I was born this way, attracted to the same sex, or my relative, or my friend. I know. Hard, hard issues. Difficult issues. Um, and I don't want to get into the whole nature-nurture debate, but again, I would say all sin is a result of the fall with Adam and Eve in the garden and the sin nature that we have. Why do people have a propensity to steal? Why do people want to go beat up their neighbor? Where do you get serial killers from? I mean, there's all these different manifestations of violence and immorality and sin in human beings. It's because of our sin nature, folks. Our world is messed up without Jesus. Our world doesn't have a chance without God. Right? Now, I know this, this topic is difficult. I know it's painful for many. I can't tell you how much I have prayed over this message. I have friends that are homosexual. I have counseled many, many people who have had these type of issues, either personally or it's a relative or a close friend. And you know what we do? We weep together. We weep. It's hard. It's hard. Especially when the culture says it's cool. Hey, love is love. Everybody has a right to love who they want to love. Nobody has a right to say anything about that. I think God would differ. And I'm trying to share with you his truth with as much love and compassion as I can. It's kind of the same as talking to a teenage boy who has discovered girls and wants to sleep with every pretty girl he sees. I said, you can't do that. But my body tells me that's what I want to do. But you're, you're a child of God. You're a believer in Christ. And God has reserved the sexual relationship for marriage. So don't cross that line if you want to please God. And before you know, any of us get upset or whatever, what I do is I, I wrestle in the scriptures with people struggling with these, these issues, any sexual issue, especially homosexuality. I, 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 I do, I, I pray with them, I pray for them, um, and I continue to love them. That doesn't stop. Why? Because God loved the world so much that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. That's why. That's why. Love prevails. People matter. Got news for you. That's why we've got a church. <laughs> Not to be a country club, but to be a life-saving station to our community, to people who need to hear about the love of God and the salvation of Jesus Christ. Amen, church? Amen. Yeah, that's why we're here. That's why we exist. Hard sayings in Scripture, difficult sayings but ones that we need to share. So we just need to be careful before pointing the finger at anyone um, because we need to remember any sort of sexual immorality or sex outside of marriage or adultery or pornography or entertainment with sex in it. Those are sinful too, right? So before we point the finger, we need to check under the hood what's going on in our own lives, all right? and love and pray for ourselves and for others. Finally, a culture crumbles when it disregards the law of love. What's the law of love? To love our neighbor as ourselves. So he goes on now, and it, <laughs> he's just kind of listing everything, okay? I want you to know where the Apostle Paul's coming from. He's just calling a spade a spade. And there are certain places in Scripture where he just lists all the examples of the depravity of humanity. 
and it's right here in black and white. In verse 26 in Romans chapter 1, actually verse 28, he says, and since they didn't see fit to acknowledge God, again, these are people who are ignoring God completely. Okay, they don't want anything to do with God in their lives. All right, since they see fit not to acknowledge him, God gave them up again, okay. I, you want to continue in sin, I will let you. And you will experience the consequences of that sin, of rejecting me. And wanting to have nothing to do with me, God says. So God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And then Paul gives a long list, starting at verse 29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, wanting what your neighbor has, malice, harming or wanting to harm your neighbor. They'll, they're full of envy, being jealous of another, murder, uh, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, talking about each other, slandering each other, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Wow. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Amen. <laughs> Man. It's a tough one. I know. I know. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Man, it sounds like what you see on the nightly news, right? Every night. The people that do this stuff. They're the ones that get on the news. But there's also things that we do each and every day. We might gossip about somebody. We might slander someone. So we can't just say that's them and not us, right? But here's the thing. I want you to hear God's heart. When Jesus was asked, what are the most important commandments in all of Scripture? Do you remember what he said? Number one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Paul's getting there, but he's making his case of how desperate the world is without God. So how do we respond I want you to remember two things. Remember two things. I'll put these on the screen. The first is, the solution isn't to make unbelievers try to live like believers, but it's to introduce them to Jesus. That's where you gotta start, okay? It doesn't help if, if you're a believer and you just start nitpicking on people that aren't believers anyway. They're not gonna listen to you. What you have to do is have a heart that they would know Jesus. Once you start to know Jesus, then the behavior will change. But they've got to come into contact with the Savior. Amen, church? And that's why our doors are always open here at Calvary. I don't care who you are or what you've done or what you're doing. If you don't know the Lord, these doors, doors are open. That's why we exist, to help people find and follow Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Because if our doors are only open to the good and righteous and holy people, then we're a club. <laughs> Let me go buy some badminton rackets, and we'll set up some nets, okay? We got the bill for it. Right. That's not what we're about. That's not what we're about. Second way to respond is this. We need to remember that some of these behaviors might include us too. Any sort of unrighteous behavior. Just because you're a believer doesn't mean you still don't sin. You still don't act selfishly at times or immoral at times. And so we need to remember that when we mess up, when we repent and confess our sins to God, he forgives us. That's the good news about Jesus. Jesus already paid the penalty that we owed, right? The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, 
if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness.